Um, a couple of uh, announcements, few announcements, uh, one of which is these flowers were for uh, the, the celebration of life for Melissa Evenson. That was uh, this past Saturday. And so please take note of that. Uh, the family uh, donated, gave those to the church for worship. Also, in your, if you picked up the, uh, the announcements page, um, this Sunday is Reformation Sunday, but it's also Confirmation Sunday. And, and two of our youth will be confirming their faith, Emily uh, Schwer and, and Reese Wilker. And their faith statements are actually printed in the announcements. So please take note of that as well. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, let's stand as we begin our worship. You know what? Since I'm helping play, I'll come over and do it from over here. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that out of your glorious riches, you will strengthen us through the power of your Holy Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And may we, being rooted and grounded in love, be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. May you be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, Get grant that we may see some Holy Spirit, we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in your salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We hear the scriptures. The first reading is written in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. The second reading is written in the third chapter of Romans. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate the righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Jesus is getting away with his closest disciples. He, this is at the beginning. Now, now they're going to be turning toward Jerusalem. This is toward the end, um, the last journey, if you will. Luke chapter 9. Once when Jesus was pray, praying in, a pri in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, Jesus has gotten away, as I said, with his closest disciples. It's kind of like they're on retreat. Um, they've gone off to the north to a, a non-Jewish area, Caesarea Philippi. In, uh, it's uh, a northeast uh, of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and in Jesus' day, uh, th there was many, many... Uh, Different religions and many things were practiced. You had Romans, you had all kinds of different people from around the Roman Empire, who some of who had been uh, retaken there and, and to populate the area and so forth. And now we see Jesus and his time here on earth is growing short. His ministry is coming to an end. They are, he is going to be turning toward Jerusalem and he is preparing his disciples for this. And the question could be, did anyone, including the disciples, truly understand who he was? The crowds, you know, they had different answers, but even, even, when, even when they gave, the, if so to speak, the right answer, you're the God's Messiah, did they fully understand, really, who he was? 
And so it is against this backdrop of this, if you will, melting pot of religions uh, in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus brings them. And he asks this question, you know, who do people say that I am? But then he also asks them the question, and that is, is, who do you say that I am? You see, the crowds were thinking, well, maybe he's John the Baptist come back. Maybe John the Baptist really didn't die. In fact, Herod wondered if Jesus was uh, John the Baptist come back from the dead, because he had killed him. Others said Elijah, and, and, and Elijah was promised to come before the day of the Messiah. The last verses in the Old Testament that we have from Malachi chapter 4, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to the parents. Jews even leave a seat open at, at uh, Passover for Elijah, for the coming, because that's what they hope for, because that, that, that foretells, if you will, or prepares the way for, uh, for the Messiah coming. And Jesus even said, you know, John the Baptist was Elijah, the second coming of Elijah, if you will. And, the, and the many said that he was a great prophet. He would come from God and he had the words of God and he, he performed miracles. People identifying Jesus with Elijah or identifying him with the, uh, with the forerunner of the Messiah. But even today, when you think about it, people identify Jesus in many, many different ways. Many call him a great moral teacher. Yes, we, we accept his teaching about we need to love our neighbor as ourself. We need to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This makes absolute sense. And you know what? It's deeply embedded in our society. It's part of who we are. Love, love has been so taught down through two millennia that for much of Western culture, we take it for granted that this, this is the foundation of, if you will, our morality. It's what we argue from in many ways. We care for the poor um, and even the place of women in our culture. It really comes out of our Christian background. You don't necessarily find that in other parts of the world. Peter wrote in his letters in the New Testament, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. The dividing walls have come down. There is a sense of equality of all. The Jews saw themselves as being higher. They were God's chosen people. They looked down many times on, on Gentiles or others, unless they came to faith. But also part of, part of our, um, our, the fact that you know, we are people that are grounded in, in Christ's teaching of love is our generosity. Many times, we probably take it for granted, but, but our country many times is the first to be there, and we give more than all the others. I remember many years ago, a Canadian who was, who was talking, he was actually a theologian, but he says, and he was from Canada, and he came down to, to, to do a theological conference, and he says, you know, one of the things that amazes me is the generosity of Americans. Denise and I were on a, a, a trip to China, and one of the couples that were on the trip with us were from India originally. They were, had moved to America, but they were from uh, India originally. And they said the same thing. They said, you know, why are you Americans so generous? And I wish I would have thought that it's because we're grounded in the teachings of Jesus. His teaching to love your neighbor as yourself, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A Canadian in a Hindu couple, seeing the love that was there. Some people associate Jesus with their political stand. But Jesus challenged leaders, but he challenged religious leaders. Not Rome, but the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders. That they, they were not living according to what God really wanted. They had, they had made all these rules and everything. But he said, but it's summed up in this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is what's at the center. 
not all the other religious things, rituals, and so forth. Hearing the crowd, what the crowds thought of him, Jesus then turns to his own disciples and said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? I wonder if there was a thoughtful silence or maybe a holding back, not wanting to give the wrong answer, not necessarily being sure they had the right answer, but Peter spoke up as he usually did. He was usually the leader. He was usually the one who would step forward. And Jesus told him, he said, you are the God's Messiah. And in Matthew, it says, it adds, the son of the living God. Peter declares Jesus to be that Messiah, God's anointed king over Israel, the rightful king, the rightful leader of Israel. But Peter, in Matthew's gospel, also, when, when Jesus begins to explain what this means, Peter says, no, this should never happen to you. you, you, you you're not going to Jerusalem to die. You're, we're going in to be successful, if you will, to, to go in. You are the rightful king. But Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. His kingdom is not of this world. He said that to Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is greater. It's not a kingdom with borders. It's not just a worldly kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom forever. The New Testament will seek again and again to describe the Christian understanding of Jesus as God's son, what that truly means. I don't think the, the, the disciples fully understood that. But after the resurrection, after the Holy Spirit came, they began to fully understand who Jesus really had been. And so it is that we hear in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, the Word became flesh, God's Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness we have received grace upon grace already given. For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is one with the Father, has made him known. In Jesus, we get to see what God is really like. Jesus says, to know me is to know the Father. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. He says, in, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him the whole universe was made. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's own being, sustaining all things with his powerful word. Peter is beginning to understand who Jesus is, but they will continue to grow in that understanding and in their faith. Our reading from Luke's gospel highlights Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? What do we believe? Who do we say that Jesus is? Who is he for us in our life? What do we put our faith in? Our declaration of who we believe Jesus is must not be simply repeating words that others have written. It's not just knowing about Jesus. It's not just getting the answer right the Messiah, the Son of God. Christian faith is knowing who Jesus is as God's Son, but also putting our trust, our faith in him, following him. He is the one. Christian faith isn't just about being part of the church. It's about trusting in and following Christ. Peter's confession of faith will be tested. We know that he denied Jesus three times. He will be tested probably again and again. And his faith will grow. It'll grow deeper. And the understanding will be more complete in terms of who he needs to be as Christ's follower, as his disciple, and what it means to 
Yes, the one who loses his life for my sake will gain it. But here we see Jesus calling them to personal conviction. But what about you? What do you say? We all need to wrestle with that question. As Christians, we all need to answer it. Who do you say that I am? C.S. Lewis wrote, he says, if Christian faith, faith is false, then it is of no consequence for life. But if it is true, then it is the most important thing in the world. Why? Because Christian faith is more than just a declaration or an idea. It is faith. It is what we truly put our trust in, what we commit our life to. Peter understood that this declaration implied following, putting his life on the line, that following the Messiah, God's Son, was going to become his life's work, the rest of his life. Jesus' response to Peter's declaration also makes this faith God's work. Again, we hear in Matthew's version of this, Blessed are you, son of si Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You see, it's God's Spirit working and moving within to help us grow in faith, to understand. That's what, what's sometimes called prevenient grace, divine grace that precedes human decision. That God is at work in us through his spirit, through his word, through Christ. We are blind, if you will, by our own human nature, our sinful nature, our lower being. It's the Holy Spirit. As, as Luther put it, he says, the Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in true faith. Now, true faith is not just a human work. But it's God's work in our lives, God touching our lives with his spirit. It's the greatest blessing that we can ever have in this life, faith in Christ. As C.S. Lewis again said, if it is true, then it is the most important thing in the world. It brings us into a unique personal relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through Christ. Jesus becomes the doorway to truly knowing God, to following God, to being touched by the truth of what God wants us to know as our creator. In Jesus, we come to know God's love for us and for all of humanity. But also in Jesus, we come to see and to know God's grace, that he was willing to send his son, to come in person of his son, to lay down his life for us, to gain for us the forgiveness and the way to eternal life. In Jesus, we come to know God's gift of his Holy Spirit working in us and through us, changing our hearts and our minds, giving us faith, hope, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, humility. Peter didn't fully understand all this as he declared that Jesus was the Messiah. But faith isn't just knowing the right answer, it's following. And that was the key. He continued to follow. He continued to grow in his faith, to deepen. Who do you put your trust in? Who will you follow and obey? Who will you imitate? What will you fight for? Who do we believe Jesus to be? Are we ready to follow, to truly be his disciples? This was the turning point for those disciples. Jesus turning toward Jerusalem, but also their coming to understand Yes, his earthly mission was ending, but their mission was not. He was revealing and teaching them about God's mission and way. It will stretch and test them to the very limits of their life. And yes, sometimes we fail, as they did, but we grow. We grow through that. We, too, fail at times. And faith is realizing and seeing it and turning to God for the strength, for the guidance that we need. Because we need the blessing of the Holy Spirit to truly live as God's disciples. Then Jesus revealed what he as the Messiah must do. The hardest thing for the disciples to grasp is that God's Messiah was going to go to the cross, was going to be rejected, 
and kill. It turns their understanding of God and Jesus upside down. It's not about power. It's all about love. Christ's glory is in his sacrifice for the sake of the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. May we all take seriously our confession of faith. May we commit our lives to following Christ. Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. May we truly walk as children of the light, God's light, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you came into this world, yes, to save us, but also to be the light of the world, to help us see who God truly is, what God truly wants for us as creatures created in his own image, people who can love and care for others and even the creation. Lord, help us to truly be your disciples, to follow in your way, we pray, and to bring this truth, this gospel, this promise, this declaration of love on God's part to the world that he truly does love. And all God's children say, Amen. Now let us affirm our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the, the church, for the world, and for all in need. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, guide the church and its leaders. We lift up to you all who work for the unity of your gospel, that your compassion may break down the walls of division that are among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gracious Heavenly Father, we also pray for the well-being of your creation, for the mountains and hills, the lakes, the rivers, the rain and the snow and the sunshine, for plants and animals and for all that you have placed on this earth for us to care for. Help us to truly be good stewards of all that you have placed under our care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for peace among nations, for those who lead at all levels of government, for judges and for all those who speak for the voiceless, that all may be treated with equity and fairness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God of compassion, we bring before you those in need of your healing and comforting touch. We lift up to you Jay Hetland, Kathy Luckow, John Ryan, Sue Bellin, Rose Benke, Bob Klesik, Mo Graff, Larry Madsen, and Ginger Linsmeyer, Janice Burkhart, Nathan Lehman, Wayne Husky, and Marlene Thompson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Heavenly Father, Hear the prayers of your people, those spoken aloud and those known only to you. And grant us peace through Jesus Christ, our coming Savior. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer by which our Lord taught us to pray, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor, and give you his joy, his peace, and his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. serve the Lord, sharing God's word, showing God's love, and serving God's word. Amen. Thanks for coming.